like to welcome Dr. Vivi tells us. Let's see what, how exactly it all proce proceeded. And then we are going to also see what stayed, what got relinquished, and what is new. We will see what is happening in the horizon of teaching and training, and why study evolution, probably to look at what happened in, what shall happen in 2050, and can we be the makers of 2050? So let's come to the story of it. This is an excellent review article, which actually tells you how it all evolved. Do you know that there were the surgeons, the buyers, and the tonits? He was, these were the surgeons who actually introduced spinals in children and published it. Later on, around 100 more cases were published and it occupied 14 pages of Lancet. But look at this, this is again very interesting. These kids, all these 100 kids, were comforted by a nurse who knew them, they ate some even had cake while the operation went on. Needless to say, 21 of them vomited and six retched. In this era, surgeon dominated, supervised the administration of anesthesia, and but they gave blocks. I guess, uh, is this ancestral conditioning? Maybe yes, but then this is how it all happened. It was Gaston Labatt actually, who wrote the famous book on regional anesthesia, which we all know. In Mayo Clinic, that was the first anesthesiologist physician who headed the section of anesthesia. Physici physicians, anesthesiologists evolved, and they formed communities later on, and of course, after forming good departments. It was Campbell who presented a paper in ASRA in 1915. 33, describing caudal epidural in extreme details. In 1955, many countries by then had proper anesthesiology and anesthesia societies, and we formed the World Federation of Society of Anesthesiologists. The world saw it in 1955. Indian Society of Anesthesiology was born on 30th of December, 1947, AORA took birth in 2011, and it's pediatric anesthesia, so IAPA took birth in 1998. We clap, shall we? Thank you. So in 1950s, oh, there was a lull in pediatric regional anesthesia because GA improved. After a lull in Australia, Melbourne, caudal was introduced in children in 1968 by McDonald and Watts in a very big way. Coincidentally, that's my birth year. Well, in Melbourne, again, the first study on blood levels of local anesthetic in children was done, and there is no looking back. Now, what is the atmosphere today? Today, we are worried about neuroapoptosis caused by general anesthesia to a developing brain. With this premise, in fact, regional anesthesia has a bigger role to play of sparing general anesthesia. And in fact, we have a lot of papers coming up by just sedation, a wee bit of sedation or no sedation and regional anesthesia going on in a very methodical way, but there is a method to do it. So from no place of regional anesthesia and pediatric anesthesia, we are here now to see a total intertwining of both these specialities, so as it, they are not separate at all. This was a themed issue published in 2012 by the International Journal of Pediatrics, open for all, it's not behind a credit card. So this, what made them dedicate an entire issue for this and what made them make it free in the PDFs for everybody to read because of the importance of this subject. Pediatric regional anesthesia now really forms a, work, a, a special category, a special section from ASRA, ISRA to AORA. AORA, right from its inception, has, has always had a very special place for pediatric regional anesthesia. We even now have Rajni Sundar Symposium, which is dedicated to a pediatric anesthesiologist, and it is initiated by none other than her own surgeon, who was Professor Ravi, Ravi Kumar. So is it that simple? Is it all started with landmarks, and then we went to PNS, and then we went to Ultrasound, yes, it did go that way, but there is lots to say in between. So yes, we understood anatomy. Yes, we, we did think of landmark. We did start going that way. Yes, PNS gave in more objectivity. We went to that speciality as such. Ultrasound came in. 
we went deeper into the subject so that the little birds could be taken care of even better. But the interconnectedness still stayed. No matter what we do, I don't think the anatomical tissue gives and the feels of it while the needle from its needle puncture through the trajectory towards the end point could never be forgotten and I guess should remain an integral part of absorbing regional anesthesia as such. So what got relinquished and what stayed and what's are new? Well, spinals almost have remained the same. The caudal epidurals and the epidurals almost have remained the same. So this is what we did way back. This was a loss of resistance technique and this is how we probably could do even today. So we could see the dural and the ligamentum flavum separation due to hydrodissection. This is a simple caudal epidural given, or a spinal in fact, simply given by an LOR method and a loss of resistance. And we know what gives the resistance and the loss of it. Calculate the drug well and you really get a good spinal. This has almost stayed, but our understanding of dosages and our understanding of local anesthetics definitely has improved. Coming to the caudal epidural, yes, again, LOR does stay. In an experienced hand, the success rate and complications of LOR is almost the same as the ones who use ultrasound. It could be PNS-wise as well, and then we have the ultrasound showing us the dural sag, which indeed is a surrogate marker to tell us till what, so till what vertebral level the drug has actually ascended. And if it is in congruence with the surgical level, the block is sure to give its best to the patient. What we did was we really compared all the three modalities to, un to answer our curious minds as to did the complications change and did the success rate change with all the three modalities. However, all the blocks, all the 300 blocks in this study were given by experienced anesthesiologists and we did realize that nothing much changed. Ha having said that, let me share this with you that we did not pick up anatomical anomalies. If you look at caudal epidural scans in preterm neonates, something that always held us with wonder, and then we scanned around 40 preterm neonates, and what we found was something very fascinating. We had a data, and we looked back, we analyzed, we measured, and we did some regressions to understand that when ultrasound is not used, because there are going to be places where it won't be used, needle insertion less than 3 mm per, kil per kilogram beyond the puncture of the sacrococcygeal membrane, which is actually the feel that we get, should prevent dural contact in 99.9% .9 of neonates. So this is something important to keep in mind. Does Ultrasound guidance had accuracy to continuous caudal epidural blocks, which is a fascinating portal through which you can give continuous analgesia for this most vulnerable population, at least for 48 hours, provided everybody is in your team, including the neonatologist. Yes, it does act accu accuracy. And the story told to us is the catheters do not behave the way you want them to behave. Well, coming to quintessential peripheral nerve example. She's a sciatic yes, nerve, and it nerve. all went with loss of resistance way back. This is how we would give. This is the loss of resistance elicited. And then, yes, yesterday somebody spoke of the tsunami dose. We would give it in a bigger dose, of course, in lesser concentration to give the block that we wanted. Then came the PNS, and now comes the ultrasound. We see the nerve, it is seen extremely well. So here is the sciatic nerve. Go there with your needle, go with a Tuhi needle, put in a catheter, go ahead with a simple needle and give a single shot block. So this is the evolution staring at you, and this is how we have progressed by a tsunami dose, by a milligram, ml per kilogram dose, and perhaps now a low dose. So this is how we have evolved, and we're getting better and better, perhaps for sure. Dual modalities, yes, does become a teaching aid. Yes, also becomes an aid in understanding whether the tissue that we think is neural tissue is indeed the neural tissue, because ultrasound is going to show us the anatomy, and PNS is going to show us the physiology of nerve for sure. So this is how dual modality can really be 
of health. If you're dealing with congenital anomalies such as arthrogryposis and all the muscles are fibrous tissues and in transverse sections they're going to fool you as nerves, then yes, this dual modality is going to really tell you what is what. Or sometimes you might just keep the probe aside, you might keep the PNS aside and go to the good old landmark technique and give a good caudal with an additive and give a good analgesia in the post-operative period. So this is how thought processes actually evolve because you never know what really fits in your patient. Every child is different and every case is different. You have to have the wisdom of choosing the right block and the right modality. Well, now let's come to N-O-R-R-A. I know we know Nora of sedation and anesthesia. Let's go to non-operating room regional anesthesia. If you can think of this, you really are giving, extending it into the into the perioperative period and not just perioperative period in the PICUs and the wards as well. Here is a case of necrotizing fasciitis, pain and repeated dressings and an agonized child. So keep an epidural, take into consideration the risk and benefit. Take the surgical team in your team, take the PICU team in your team and the parents need to understand. Then pick up the risk and benefit and go ahead Keep an epidural, let the dressings go on, but see to it that the screen is placed because children are going to be anxious, not just because of pain, but they are going to be anxious because of many other reasons, such as seeing that there are some people working on them and have their moms set, sit by their bedside. Roll into NICU's preterms. Well, social fabric is changing. Prematurity is increasing and care for them is increasing. Their veins are at a premium and arteries can be punctured and we do come across ischemias and here are blocks which are somatic as well as sympathetic can really help into improving ischemic limbs. Do we have a role in cardiac cats? Yes, indeed yes. If you see that the, there are these bizarre arrhythmias happening in even smaller age groups as two and three years of age, give them a good high thoracic epidural, show them this is a therapeutic and diagnostic test for their destination therapy, decrease their arrhythmic load, go, and so that the destination therapy of sympathectomy, which is a surgical, non-reversible stuff, is still going to work. And if it doesn't work with a well-placed epidural, it probably is not going to work with a surgical sympathectomy. They probably might have to think of some other thing. Coming to the power of reinvention, there is always a room for that. Well, coming to ultrasound guided supraclavicular supra block or the subclavian perivascular has come back into vogue, a beautiful block, but we gave up because we thought that there is a high puncture of pleuras. The pleura is right in the neck and the and, and, and children have a high respiratory rate, even if you give general anesthesia and controlled ventilation. You need to keep that rate. Hence, we almost had given up, but then with ultrasound, this beautiful block which covers the entire extremity in one go is reinvented. So this is another literature paper that really tells you that. Well, interscaling, the indications are few, but when they are, they are there. Without touching the physiological deranged milieu of a septic neonate, if this case comes to you, for drainage of the shoulder abscess, then we could go with a simple interscaling and don't touch the physiological milieu and give the kid back intact is a possibility. Now coming to the last scene, our understanding of systemic local anesthetic management has definitely improved. Our understanding of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics have definitely improved. Our Dosages are better. We understand how to fine tune them. We understand that need, things need to be given in aliquots. We understand that monitoring is extremely important. Over and above that, now we have the wisdom of monitoring and looking at the patient holistic and not just looking at blocks while we give blocks, but also note that the airway and the monitoring is going on pristine. If there is nobody else assisting you at that time, 
train somebody to do so or train your ears to hear the pulse oximeter going. We are better off with equipments for sure. Now, do we need long-term studies? Yes, we do need long-term studies to evolve better. This is one study which is showing us that regional anesthesia can improve res cardiorespiratory monitoring uh, complications in pre-tumming vinyl hernias. We started avoiding instrumentation on artificial ventilation in in a thousand units almost this is a retrospective data that we can present from children's anesthesia services and we've let go of most of the general anesthesia deformities they can take you for a toss and this is what we can let go if pns if because pns is not going to give you an end motor response want to go peripheral pick up two he needles pick up ultrasound probe and let get going with the continuous catheters. But how? You should know that there is a sensory motor separation that can happen in the wards. Don't give them, give them a dead extremity. Neither the child nor the surgeon is going to like it. Give them an extremity which is pain-free enough to even permit movements. And if this child with a particular regime now becomes grumpy, is not interested in you, not interested in anything around, don't escalate the pain medications, but call the surgeon. You're going to help them take care of the compartment syndrome. Another example of a similar kind. Now, meningomyelocele and central neuroaxis. How have we evolved? We've picked up ultrasound probes, and we have seen if the osseous framework to some extent is OK, and if the OK and precise and just the way it should be, and if the blocks and, and the case really needs that kind of a block, go deal with the central neuroaxis. So this is what we have found that it's pretty much safe if you have really pondered upon it deep. So either you create evidence or are you follow evidence. It's up to you and how you look at your subject. Well, what's happening on teaching horizons? These are, we have fellowships. There are fellowships all over the world. AORA has a postdoctoral fellowship of one year, and these are our examiners. And Children's Anesthesia Services has a fellowship with WFSA on regional anesthesia. I leave with you with the testimonials of two of our fellows. One is from the WFSA, and this is what she says. A pediatric anesthetist from Nigeria. I need a fellowship. Cutting the whole story short, she is from Nigeria. She's learned here, and we had the privilege of giving her whatever we know, and she's gone back and started her teaching program and actually replicates what we did. So this is Nitya did with us in AOR, uh, with AORA. What happens in the globe? What is happening about research and publications? This is caudal block in a couple of countries and publications that happened in last couple of years. Look at India's share. We are definitely evolving. Sciatic nerve, look at India's share. We are there on the horizon. Intraclavicular blocks, look at India's share, one of my personal favorites. Who says we are not publishing? We are, but we probably have to answer long-term questions. And coming to 2050, it's promising. Who knows how many of us would be actually witnessing 2050? And who knows, probably somebody of you pr might remember this, this session and this talk and might give a smile. Thank you so much. And let me tell you one thing. If we need to keep our blocks simple so that most of us can master them. Thank you.